you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming here with a great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Be sure you guys like, subscribe to us on YouTube.com forward slash Chris Voss. You can hit the bell notification button. You can subscribe to all the amazing, wonderful videos we have, all the brilliant authors we have on the show. You can go to goodreads.com forward slash Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there. You can go see all the bloody groups we have on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all the different places, all the kids are at these days you can see the chris voss show as well today we have three three amazing authors we got tired of just having one author at a time on the show or two authors at a time we're just like screw it we're going for three and so we said who wrote a book that's uh, coming out that has three authors and sure enough there was one <laughs> <laughs> and it's coming out june 8th it's entitled forget the alamo the rise and fall of an american myth Seems like the ending should be like shot, shots fired, but I suppose we'll find out what that's about. It's by Brian Burrow, Chris Thomason, and Jason Stanford, and uh, they've been joining us today so they can tell us about this wonderful and amazing book. And this episode is brought to you by a sponsor, ifi-audio.com, and their micro IDSD signature. It's a top of the range desktop transportable DAC and headphone app that will supercharge your headphones. It has two brown burr DAC chips in it and will decode high-res audio and MQA files. We're using it in the studio right now. I've loved my experience with it so far. It just makes everything sound so much more richer and better and takes things to the next level. IFI Audio is an award-winning audio tech company with one aim in mind, to improve your music enjoyment of quality sound, eradicate noise, distortion, and hiss from your listening experience. Check out their new incredible lineup of DAX and audio enhancement devices at ifi-audio.com. But some insights to them as well. Brian Burrow is the author of six books, including The Big Rich, Days of Rage, Public Enemies, and the number one New York Times bestseller, Barbarians at the Gate. Chris Thomason is a columnist for the Houston Chronicle and San Antonio Express News, and the author of the New York Times bestselling Thomason Hill about his family's slave owning history in Texas. From 1995 to 2007, he reported from more than 30 countries and nine wars for the Associated Press. Jason Stanford is a writer whose bylines have appeared in Texas Monthly, the Austin American Statesman, the Los Angeles Times, MSNBC, the Texas Tribune, and Texas Highways. The former communications director for Austin Mayor Steve Adler, Stanford previously worked as a political consultant and helped elect or re-elect more than 30 members of Congress. He publishes a weekly newsletter called The Experiment. And what do you know? All three are on the show. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having us on. Thanks for coming on. Congratulations on the new book. It's coming out June 8th, so people should pick that baby up. Let's go all three, uh, all through three of you and uh, give us your dot-coms, your places or plugs where people can go find you on the interwebs. I guess I'm supposed to go first. I, I, I'm just, I'm on Twitter, Brian Burr, and I'm on Facebook the same. That's pretty much it. I'm on the uh, HoustonChronicle.com and ExpressNews.com. And I'm at jasonstanford.substack.com. There you go. I guess we're working the alphabet. B, C, J. Yep. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> sure. There you go, guys. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Congratulations on the book. What motivated you guys to write this book? And the three of you get together on it, too, I think might be an interesting story. Brian, why don't you kick us off? It was Chris's idea. The three of us were sitting I had breakfast one Sunday morning, as we did at the time, on Austin's South Congress Avenue and throwing ideas and back and forth. And Chris suddenly started talking about one of his columns for the Chronicle about the Alamo. And Jason and I were kind of eating our eggs, half listening, until it, the story started telling got really good. Basically said, everything you think you know about the Alamo is wrong. 
And as someone who grew up in Texas and has lived here for a long time, I, I started listening and Chris went on to talk about how the Alamo as a symbol has been viewed in the Texas Mexican American community often as a, a symbol of kind of Anglo oppression. This was entirely news uh, to me and I think to Jason. And at some point I, I remember slamming my hand down on the desk saying, this is a book. And 99 out of 100 times when a literary type says that, nothing ever comes of it. And this time, something has. Two years later, we have a book that we're tremendously excited about that we think breaks a lot of new ground and urging a reassessment uh, of the Alamo legend. And Chris, are you surprised now that Brian has told you that him and Jason normally aren't even listening to you during breakfast? I was going to object to that. I was hanging on his every word. Chris is fascinating. Brian, getting Brian's attention is like, try, have, you, have you ever raised a golden retriever with behavioral <laughs> problems? That's what it's like getting Brian to focus. Wow. So the fact that Chris's idea got his attention at all really is, I speak, I think, speaks to the power of the idea. Yeah. I'm well, not I, sure. I think every, you know, I, I want to apologize. There's a very angry mockingbird right outside my window, and oh. I'm, I'm asking someone to chase it away. But hey, Chris. Little known fact, that's how they got the name to kill a mockingbird. It was a Zoom call. Yeah. It was yeah. a Zoom call. Yeah, I think Jason and Brian were fascinated about how long I was going to live after I wrote this column about the Alamo. <laughs> because well, obviously this is a, a story that people take very seriously down here. And, and I was basically calling it out because the city is looking at spending $450 million on renovating the place and basically just reinforcing a lie. And that... And that was what the column was, and I think that led to the book. There you go. Well, I, I'm not sure if I'm at a friendship intervention uh, meeting or if we're talking about a book, but give us the overall arcing nature of uh, what you guys have written in this book, and then we'll get into some of the details. Chris? Yeah? Uh, yeah. So if you start from the premise that everything you think you know about the Alamo is probably a lie. We start out going back and saying, hey, what actually happened? What do we know about what happened? And then we established, guess what? There was no line in the sand. Baby Crockett did not die swinging old Betsy. He tried, he surrendered. They didn't fight to the death the night before. Travis tried to surrender and Santa Ana wouldn't accept the conditions. So we established that. And then the next question is, where do the lies come from? And, and that was part two of the book. And finally, we end up with, they're still telling lies at the Alamo because they want to build this $300 million museum to house Phil Collins's artifacts that are, guess what? Lies just like the stories we learned in seventh grade Texas history class. Is that Phil Collins a singer? Yes. Yeah, yeah you got to get the singer has the largest collection of Alamo artifacts in the world. <laughs> Chris, you've you so. got to get to chapter 23. It's the end of the book, but in some, it's the, it's the excerpt is on the cover of the current issue of Texas Monthly. Long story short, this big new museum at the Alamo is built around the largest collection of Alamo memorabilia ever assembled by the singer, yes, Phil Collins. Unfortunately, we got a tip late in the game that the Collins collection going into this big museum was not quite what it appeared to be. That in fact, most of the items had little or no provenance. In other words, there was no way to know whether they were authentic. And looking at the, the big 12 or 15 items, those directly linked to Crockett and Travis and the heroes of the Alamo, most if not all of them appear, according to our research, to be fake. So that's made a little bit of news in down here but that is much, that's just one chapter, literally, of a book that's about a 200 year story. So let me lay a foundation really quick because we have an international audience too. So for those, it sounds silly to say this, so hopefully I don't offend a lot of Texans, but there are people in the world outside of the America that probably aren't too familiar with what the Alamo is. Can uh, would one of you explain what the Alamo is for those folks? Oh, if, you, if, 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 if I were writing a dummies uh, a book, for the, the Alamo is a place uh, where during the Texas Revolt, Texas Revolution of 1835 and 1836 against the Mexican governor, a government of Santa Ana, uh, a group of about 200 Texans manned an old mission outside then small city of San Antonio called the Alamo, where despite copious warnings that the, an enormous Mexican army was on the way, they decided to sit, uh, sit and fight it out. 
They wrote many dramatic and beautiful romantic letters asking for help, which is really the source of history. That's the read those letters so resonated then and, and now. Help by and large did not come. The Mexicans then swooped in, killed them to a man. But what happened then was the Texas, the reason the Alamo became so famous is the Texas Army under Sam Houston used the rally and cry, remember the Alamo, to rally their small army to victory uh, at the Battle of San Jacinto against Santa Ana, thus giving Texas its independence. Ten years later, it became a U.S. state. There you go. There you go. For those of us who've seen the Disney movies, I grew up watching the Disney movies of Davy Crockett and Disney. I was surprised that you guys talked about how those that sort of romanticized that sort of thing. How true were those movies and what was the real story? The, what we found is that every generation uses the Alamo as a metaphor for whatever they're facing today. So mm -hmm. Walt Disney was worried about global communism. He was worried about unionization of his movie studios. He was a hardcore right winger. And so he ordered his producers to go out and find these examples of self-reliance and what he considered to be American values and rugged, rugged self-reliance. And he, they came up with Davy Crockett and then just took all the joy out of Davy. And instead of him being this comic, rabble-rousing politician, they turn him into this really stoic, mid-century American icon, which is what Phil Collins fell in love with. He loved the idea of this iconic, stoic man voluntarily fighting to the death for a larger cause. And of course, that's not really what happened, but it's what everyone thinks happened thanks to Walt Disney. Yeah, that, that cemented in my mind. I had that whole, I, I grew up in that area of John Wayne and the shows and stuff like that. And yeah, that really cemented my, my thinking process on that. Anybody else want to comment on that before I move to the next question? It was really, the Alamo was a, a very much a Texas thing until that era. And we argue that it was really Disney's Davy Crockett and John Wayne's The Alamo Movie and then the presidency of Lyndon Baines Johnson, who just adored the Alamo, that really took the Alamo from a local slash regional thing to a truly international icon, a story that is known around the world. Yeah, Lyndon Johnson couldn't stop lying about the Alamo to the extent that he invented relatives who died at the Alamo. Are you kidding and, me? Seriously? No, I'm not kidding you. Yeah, and he, he and he flew halfway around the world to address the troops and tell them about his great granddaddy or great uncle or something like that who died at the Alamo. And these are even for the Alamo, these are easily disproven facts. And, and so he was so fixated on talking about the Alamo to drum up support for Vietnam which if you think about it, is a really bad metaphor for Vietnam. Yeah, that's true. Well, some writers accused him of having Alamo syndrome. Wow. And, and to this day, the Alamo is used to, to whip up people into a patriotic fervor to go kill people in another country. There are people in Congress during the Afghanistan and Iraq wars who referred to Santa Ana as a modern day Saddam Hussein, or as a latter day Saddam Hussein. Now, you guys talk about what the real Battle of Alamo was about and what they were trying to do. What was the real Battle of, of the Alamo about? That's what people argue about to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to find an academic consensus. Mm -hmm. Over the last 50 years, pretty much academics have looked at the whole thing and kind of thrown up their hands and called it a clash of civilizations, to which we say, well, yeah, but that doesn't really address the causes. There's all sorts of causes that have been cited over the years. Some have cited ethnic hatred. Some have said it was about taxes. We say all that contributed, but, but the, the central underlying thing, the only thing really, that the Mexican government and, the Tex and its Texas colonists had been arguing about for 15 years was slavery. Slavery was at the heart of the Texas economic model. Chris, it's the only reason people came to Texas was to farm cotton, and they only knew how to do it with slaves. The Mexican government of, that came into power in 1821 at the very beginning of the Texas colony was rapidly abolitionist. And it's difficult, it was difficult then, and can sometimes be difficult now, for Americans to view the Mexican government as taking the moral high ground here. But here, they, they clearly were. And wow. if you go back and look at the correspondence and the books and everything, the father of Texas, Stephen F. Austin, tried every argument in every horn-swoggling move 
that you could possibly do to keep slavery in place. And ultimately, while slavery was not the trigger of the revolt, it was clearly, we argued, the underlying cause. It's about power and keeping industry going. It was about money. It was about yeah. how, the te how Texans made money and how much the Mexicans wanted to stop that. Wow, this is crazy, man. So you guys talk about, let's see, discusses indispensable contributions by, I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, even though I'm a ZZ Top fan, Te Tejanos? Am I mm -hmm. pronouncing that right? Tejanos. Tejanos, okay. Z what Reading ZZ Top album names help. Which are Texans of Mexican origin to Texas independence. How did this play in? Who, who are these people? Tell us more and how this played into this. The earliest settlers were Spanish, and mm -hmm. Creole. So when we say Creole, we mean that people of Spanish origin or people mixed with, with the indigenous tribes who had married into them. And you get this mestizo mix. And these people who lived north of the Rio Grande and south of the Red River were called Tejanos because that was the province of Tejas in Mexico. And they were an independent lot. And in many ways, they started the revolution when uh, Santa Ana declared himself dictator. When Santa Ana did away with a, a federal government. He wanted a central government where he could be a dictator. And the Tejanos were like, listen, you know, we've been here for four or five generations. We're unhappy with this. We, we're going to join our brothers in, Zapa, in uh, the Zapotecas to rebel against Santa Ana and demand a return to the original constitution. The, the whites Anglos who had come from the United States, many of them illegally crossing the border and settling in, in Texas. That's to me one of the great ironies is that a lot of these Texans were illegal immigrants to Mexico. They co-opted this Tejano fight for a fairer Mexican government and turned it into a, a, a revolt to establish an independent country to basically steal a third of Mexico from the rightful Mexican government. And so we have people like Juan Seguin, who was born and raised third generation San Antonian, who was really critical to these early days of fighting against Mexican oppression in the guise of Santa Ana. And then you've got Lorenzo de Zavala, who was the minister of finance under Santa Ana, realized that Santa Ana was going to be a dictator, and then came to Texas to raise an army to overthrow Santa Ana, and ends up becoming the first vice president of the Republic of Texas, and is immediately shunted aside because the white racist from the United States didn't want any Mexicans in their government. Wow. And so for a hundred years of Texas history, the role of these Tejanos and these Mexicans has been basically whitewashed out of Texas history. And, and that's something we try to bring back. That's but great. The, Go ahead. The, yeah, the thing to add there is that the Tejanos were the Anglo, the Americans, the critical allies for and during the revolution. They supported the, the Alamo itself. Some fought and died there. Others fought and died at San Jacinto. And one of the great, tra maybe the great tragedy of early Texans is that once the Anglos won, they systematically pushed many, if not all the Tejanos out of a lot of the towns um, and small cities of Texas at the time in, in, in a kind of ethnic cleansing. And it was a real betrayal of our allies. And the, as Chris mentions, they, that is reflected in the way they are entirely written out of 100, for the last 150 years of Texas history. It's wow. really only been about the last 50 years that we that, that modern research has played up the contributions of the Tejanos. Yeah, it's amazing how much of our history is whitewashed. We learn that every day as we interview authors and have them on and learn about all sorts of different pieces of missing pieces of history that have been whitewashed. So it seems like the Alamo is the Alamo the central keystone of this whole narrative that Texans are always running around bragging about or saying about how we should be independent, we need to succeed, secede from the United States. And of course, we saw how good they are at running their own electrical grid when they disconnect from us. Good luck with that. Is this, is this, is this part of one of those keystones where, where this is the independence of Texas? We don't need the U.S. Uh, it comes from. Yes, absolutely. And it's not just the, the Texas chauvinism. 
It, it's also the a touchstone for modern conservative thought. In his last State of the Union speech, Donald Trump referenced the Texas Patriots who fought and died at the Alamo. And then he mm -hmm. ad lived the beautiful, beautiful Alamo. This is an incredibly important symbol to that school of thought. Wow. To the extent that Texas has an identity, Chris, it is rooted in what we all here call the Texas creation myth. And mm. that myth is the Alamo. It is the Alamo and to some extent the San, Gise and San Jacinto. It is at the root of what many call Texas exceptionalism. That is the idea that folks in Texas and are, are somehow a little bit more special than the rest of the country, a little bit of cuddle above Delaware and Rhode Island. And you give a lot of Texans, especially white Texans, a beer or two, and you'll hear chapter and verse about this. I know I have. <laughs> you guys are special. I thought about moving down there, and then I saw you guys' property taxes and said, nope. <laughs> uh, but Texas is a beautiful place. I love going to South by Southwest, but I, I don't think Austin counts. Is Austin uh, in a different state these days, or how does that work in Texas now? They call Austin the People's Republic of Texas, yeah. The People's Republic, okay. All right. You guys also talk about in the book some of the political battles of how the Alamo should be taught in schools. So continuing this liar narrative, tell us a little bit about that. There is a widespread consensus among historians and academics that the, the history we teach about Texas, and that is required of every seventh and fourth grader in the state, isn't the full story even close. But to get that story ta taught in public schools, you have to get it past what's the, the State Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And these are elected officials who determine what the curriculum is going to be. And they're elected officials. And so to get unpaid, by the way, Texas public officials, and you get what you pay for there, to admit that slavery was at least a cause of the Texas Revolution, or revolt as we call it, is near impossible these days. The real fight over the last two decades at the State Board of Education hasn't been about teaching the full history of the Alamo and the Texas Revolution. It's been, do we include Hispanics in the hero part of the story? They wow. still, everyone's fighting over how they teach it as a heroic narrative and not say, we teach the Civil War more accurately in Texas than we do the Texas Revolution. The wow. Texas Revolution is so sacrosanct. Sorry? Tell them the fact that the heroic is the law. Yeah, there is nowhere else in the Texas curriculum that teachers are required to teach that anyone is a hero except at the Alamo. Are By you serious? Laws, I am serious. They fought yeah. so make... long over whether or not they, they – how and like, what form of the word hero were they going to use in the state form uh, curriculum and who exactly that applied to. Wow. The fight was – does this just apply to like the big three, Crockett, Travis, and Bowie, or does it apply to everyone there? And – especially the Tejanos who died with them. Yeah. That's a law. Holy yeah. crap. The force, the force of government requires every seventh grader to be taught that they were heroic. I'd hate to be the, the teacher who goes to jail for that. Is that you're like sitting in there in the bail office and what are you in for? Uh, I murdered a family. And what did you do? Yeah. I, I said that Davy Crockett was a bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> I could, that, that wouldn't go over. I don't know. Maybe. maybe you wouldn't even have know. to say he was a bad guy. You just have to say he just died not heroically. Yeah. Because he surrendered. It, Disney tells a completely different story, if I recall. Yeah, it was well known in, in the early part of last century that he'd surrendered. It was commonly accepted. But Fess Parker went down sw you know, swinging his club. And so, therefore, that was history to most boomers. Yeah. And, there you go. Well, movies yeah. would never and lie, so have never lost. Yeah. I mean, the lieutenant governor in Texas, who's an incredibly powerful office, he runs the Texas Senate and he's a I think it's safe to say he's a feared politician in this state. He has a scale model of the Alamo in his state office. Wow. Yeah. He's just embracing it. And the, these guys are just using it as a political cudgel or, or a thing to whip up votes, to whip up money, to fundraise. You guys talk about how the Alamo is part of the ongoing conversation around race and racism and and how we had, need to reckon with it. How is it become more pitched in the late, last few years with the you know rise of white nationalists and Donald Trump and all this racism that we've seen? Yeah, there was. When I write uh, newspaper columns in the San Antonio Express News and the Houston Chronicle, and I talk about the Alamo, I always point out that it was more a battle for slavery than for liberty. And when I do this, the, the mountain of hate mail, a former commissioner of the land office, who the job that's now held by George P. Bush, his predecessor, Jerry Patterson, writes 
articles in newspapers across the state condemning me. I get angry emails pe- from people saying, how dare you try to sully the Alamo with talks about racism? Because it's the conservative ideal. Fight to mm-hmm. the death for what you believe in. Draw a line in the sand that you're either brave enough to cross it or you're a coward. It, it's just, it's such an integral part of right-wing political rhetoric that it's almost impossible to go back and say, hey, this is actually a much more interesting story if you would just stop believing the lies. Yeah. And I think that's the problem with our history. We want to believe the lies because facing the truth is painful. It's ugly. It's not pretty in any way, shape or form. And uh, there's a bit of shame to it. Yeah. Chris, can I add something to what Chris said just a second ago, as, as far as the Alamo being a symbol of political thought these days, when the gun rights groups, when they have the come and take it machine gun, mm-hmm. that's a direct steal from the Texas Revolution when the Mexican <laughs> government was trying to take a cannon from a town called Gonzales, and they sewed a flag that said come and take it with a cannon in the middle. That's a Texas revolutionary symbol that they're using for gun rights these days. And, and wow. Chris, you can't underestimate the fervor with which this is still in the 21st century being promulgated. When one of the one of the many plans for the new Alamo suggested that they were going to move this mammoth 60 foot statue that has the the names of those who died, they were going to move it basically from one sidewalk 50 feet over to another sidewalk. Overnight, you get these militia types who show up in camo camping out overnight with AK-47s, basically saying, over our dead bodies. It was at that point that Chris and Jason and I started trading texts saying, hey, let's not share our home addresses in this book. Uh, That was going to be my next question. How well has your book been received so far? Of course, I guess it hasn't technically come out yet, but there's probably, uh, you're probably getting some hate mail already from the rumbling. Oh yeah, I know already. People, when we had, just when the blurb came out, just the name of the book, when that was announced, hate oh. mail started coming. And Brian's been getting uh, criticized on Twitter. I got some crazy comments last night. And you're right, the book, the book hasn't come out yet. But I'm shocked that the Wall Street Journal praised our book in, in a post today in their review. And so we can't be that crazy if the Wall Street Journal doesn't hate us. Rupert Murdoch probably hasn't seen it yet. So, <laughs> no. in, Someone in didn't run up on him. In all seriousness, Chris, we, we invite the criticism because we, if we have any goal, we're not politicians, but we do think, especially at a time where Latinos are poised to become a majority in Texas, we do think that it's time for a constructive public dialogue about what the Alamo means, how it should be remembered, how it should be revered, uh, whether it should be revered. It's the type of conversation that, frankly, has seldom taken place outside the city of San Antonio statewide. In in large part, we suggest, and I I think the guys would agree with me, because the state government and state media is still largely dominated by Anglo journalists and politicians. And alternate point of views, especially the Tejano, Latino point of view, just have really a few times people have uh, popped up and tried to say the type of thing we're saying now. They have been knocked down pretty quickly. I've been always surprised by the white uh, nationalist racism in, in Texas and stuff. And I, I don't know the Texas demographics, but I always was like, it seems to me like there should be a large Hispanic community there. How soon are the Hispanic community looking to take over as a population there? Anglos only make up 41% of Texas today. Wow. And uh, most estimates are by 2025, as no later than 2030, Hispanics will be the majority in Texas. So we're not far from that day. If you look at any major public school system, it's 85% Latino. Wow. And, and, and what, what Anglos, Chris, what Anglos really fail to appreciate, and that I know was news to me and maybe to the guys, is the extent to which the Alamo has been regarded in the Latino community as really a symbol of oppression, a symbol of racism, mm. a symbol of a beefy white guy going by uh, a, a Latino guy, punching him in the arm and saying, hey, remember the Alamo, dude. It's just, it's been a subtle thing for a long time. And I, I canvassed all my white friends with that over the last two years and not a soul knew it. And I, I think just 
if people would start talking about what this means and how hurtful it can be, maybe we would have some change. This is uh, the question I was going to ask you next was, is this a symbol like the symbols of Robert E. Lee and other ones that we've been taking down, all the monuments that uh, have been taken down? Jim Crow era thing. Of course, this is probably, I think, before Jim Crow. But is this... So once again, this is one of those symbols that's used for oppression. certainly got caught up in the uh, post-Charlottesville conversations and Mm -hmm. George Floyd. And in fact, after George Floyd, when there were all the marches and unrest around the country, someone went and defaced the the, the cenotaph, which was the statue that Brian was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And I I don't recall exactly what was on there. Chris, Brian, do you remember what the guy graffitied on there? It was a downward arrow and white supremacy downward arrow the Alamo, supremacy yeah. down with the Alamo. <clears throat> yeah, and there was and, the time Ozzy went there and peed, so there was that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that really got caught up in racial politics, though. Yeah, but that was what just happened a drunk after guy. That graffiti, yeah, what happened after that graffiti, there was some rumor that they're, they were going to go and occupy the Alamo, and politicians took turns promising to defend the Alamo and criticizing each other for not being pro-Alamo enough, and the militia and a bunch of police and law enforcement surrounded the Alamo that night. It was a shocking sight. Damn it. They really blocked us liberals. That was our evil plan was to take the Alamo. Darn it. Yeah. Darn it. Foiled again. Mm-hmm. Foiled again. Yep. This is pretty good. I do like how, do you, have you guys hired security at all? Or do you, are you pretty comfortable with uh, the security you have right now? I got to tell you, Chris, is by far the least well-known of the bunch. I haven't even gotten any hate mail yet, so huh. I'm not Still time. We'll be publishing this out. Hey, I, I got to tell you, the trolls that we have on the Chris Voss show, there's a lot of them on YouTube. But they make you feel wanted. They make you, yeah. they, they stay involved in your life. People come and go and forget about you. But the trolls, they stick with you, man. They love I, you. I got to tell you, I, I, I get so few trolls, I have to tell myself bad things in the mirror when I shave. Do you? Do you? Yeah. You know what? A lot of people get a wife for that. So No, you know. no, she's nice. I got a nice wife. You got a nice wife. Yeah, she have yeah. a sister? I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, guys, what have we covered or touched on in the book? It's I, I think every all road, political roads eventually lead back to Trump. George mm-hmm. P. Bush, Jeb's son, the governor's, the, I'm sorry, the nephew and grandson of two former presidents. He is the land commissioner, which is all you need to know about it for this conversation is he has jurisdiction over the Alamo. And he is going to be running for attorney general against a big pal of Trump's who is, he's been under indictment and now FBI investigation, but because he's the attorney general, he got it moved to a friendly county and he's never going to trial. Serious? Uh, I know it's Texas. For all the stuff that guy's done? Yeah. Wow. Yep. Wow. The political corruption in Texas, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed going back Thomas DeLay and going back forever, it seems like. You guys seem to have a lot. The that- political corruption in Texas is so pervasive, it's actually legal. It's actually <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, I was going to say, if you don't pass any laws against corrupt practices, then you don't get to call them corrupt practices. Wow. That's just astounding, man. That's just astounding. Yep. And what the, what is going to be interesting with Texas is a lot of Silicon uh, California people are moving there. A lot of my friends have moved there. A lot of people from Silicon Valley are moving there. I don't know if it's going to push the state blue, but who knows? But well, it has up our housing prices in Austin by 40% in one year. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's stunning just driving around Austin, the sheer yeah. number of out-of-town license plates. Yeah, uh, that's that's where they're all moving honks, is Austin. Somebody honks you from California. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, but there's, there are just a stunning amount of people, at least certainly coming into the Austin area from, from everywhere, but especially California. Now, it's, is the new laws that Texas passed on voting rights, is, is that going to be upheld in court, do you think, or is it going to fail in lawsuits? The Texas Democrats walked out in the yeah, last sorry. hours and, ca- and blocked a vote. So the, the law did not pass. The governor's promised to call a special session, but it already sounds like the Republicans are beginning to water down the voting restrictions. We won't know until the, the special session is called, but we know a lot of corporations are opposed. A lot of chamber of commerce types are opposed to these laws. So it'll be really interesting to see how they're resurrected. In fact, I think I just read this morning or last night, uh, there's a, 
I think it's South Carolina or North Carolina County has banned Coke machines because of the Coke's opposition, spoken opposition to an Alabama or Georgia voting law. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. Is that well, a, is never going to recover from that one? Jeez. Yeah, yeah, they're never going to recover. Oh. I, I'm sure it's some backwater town, but it was interesting to me. I was like, that's an interesting blowback. And then I think your guys' governor was uh, claiming he'd defund the he'd defund the legislature if they didn't vote and and go his way. Yeah. Does he control the fund? Can he do that, or is that just a? Uh... Chris has a line item. Veto. Yeah, he, he has a line item veto, but it's a pretty big cleaver because the yeah. way the line items are set up, he would have to basically fire all the janitors in the Capitol building, mm. along yeah. with not paying the lawmakers. So it's an empty threat. I don't think he's going to yeah. be able to. You got to keep those toilets running, man. You don't keep those toilets running clean. Everything goes to hell. I think we found that out. So I, I wanted to get back to a minute about the Alamo as a symbol. And I think it's really important to point out that it's the story that you tell at the Alamo, because the Alamo is 300 years old. And the Battle of the Alamo lasted 13 days. And so really the big debate now is not whether or not the edifice of the chapel is a symbol of white supremacy, but whether or not you tell a story of white supremacy on the grounds of the Alamo. And that's where we are now, because you have people like George P. Bush, who is saying, we're going to focus on those 13 days, nothing else counts. Wow. And then you wow. have the Top Palam Kohatikans, a Native American group, 1,800 of their ancestors converted to Catholicism, and they were buried in front of the church, which right now is a busy street. Wow. And they, it, it's literally built on a Native American burial ground. So they want those 18 graves, 1,800 graves recognized. Then you have the Woolworths department store that was built on the old wall of the Alamo. And that is where African-Americans rallied to demand desegregation in 1960. And is one of the first desegregated lunch counters. And they want their history recognized. So when we talk about the Alamo being the Western wall of Texas religion, it really is the Jerusalem of Texas. Everyone's got a claim to that land and how what we do with it will determine whether or not it becomes a symbol of white supremacy or, frankly, a symbol of all the wonderful things that Texas represents. Holy moly. I did not know that was you nailed it right to the wall. That was the Jerusalem of this thing. Was that the Woolworth picture where they they did the shake a sit in? That that was in a different state, but okay. they did the exact same thing yeah. at that lunch counter. There just wasn't a photographer. So. Okay. Okay. But yeah, this is, that's amazing that they built on top of a cemetery, but welcome to America. So yeah, this is, that's really interesting. And that's probably why this fight over this, this uh, symbol is so hard. It, it's interesting what we're going through. We're either seeing the dying of this white nationalist, this racism, and us hopefully coming to grips with some of our issues surrounding 450 years of just ugliness with the building of this country, going back to the Puritans with the, the Shining Hill sort of crap. And, and al although, who knows, we could be taking a turn for another dark run down the Trump fascist run. And it could be the rise of fascism. I mean, when Tom Hart was on the show, his... He said to me, he goes, you know what January 6th was? And I go, what? He goes, practice. It was a warm-up. <laughs> it was really alarming to think about. And, of course, he was what's going on in our politics. So I think it's really important you guys have given rise to this and uh, called it out and detailed it and everything else. Any further thoughts or last thoughts as we go out? I guess one thing I'd say is that we've gone out of our way, Chris, to, as we say, to take the Alamo and its history seriously, but not to take ourselves too seriously in the book. It's not intended to be a sermon to you as a reader that what you know is wrong and all that we know that's right. It's really intended to be an encouragement to try to reclaim the historical Alamo, the actual Alamo, as opposed to the stories that have hit the stories and distortions that have arisen over the, the, the last 180 years that have made it so difficult.
for today's generations to go back and understand what actually happened. And so we try to keep the tone light. We try to keep the tone encouraging. And really, I found this entire project to be about the most fun I've ever had delving into historical material because there's so much that's new there to tell and to share with people who care about history. There you go. Anyone else want to chime in? Not going to top. That's exactly right. There you go. Nailed it out of the park. There you go. Good job, guys. I think this is I think this is important. We've spent the last last year and a half, we had so many great book authors that on have been talking about the breaking down of a lot of these American myths, a lot of them that were supported by white nationalism, and of course, the whole narrative of, of uh, George Floyd and dealing with racism in this country. And so I think this is great that we're talking about this. Do you guys see this maybe becoming a book or a documentary where someone goes into deeper? Have you guys got option yet on it? We've had interest. Yeah. I think it would be a great movie just to dispel some of the Disney things. Maybe Disney will buy it, and then they'll just do whatever they want with it or something. Much like the Star Wars series. They'll be like, no, Davy Crockett. No, I don't know. Did Davy Crockett ever have that stupid hat? Was that just a myth? Or did oh, really that, hat, that hat was real. That hat was real. Um, All right, well. It was, so, well. He was a politician, and a good politician has a trademark. And yeah. So that's what he wore. So he was, uh, he fought at the Alimony and he was Alamo and he was a fashion god. So who knew? <laughs> I tell you, Chris, as far as other projects coming from this, I'm working with a musician named Walker Lukens, a friend of mine. And he's, his mom was a history teacher and he's real excited about this book. And we're talking about where he, we're doing a, basically a mixtape, getting other musicians to do original songs about this book. And when he approached other musicians in Texas about doing this, ones who are Gen X and younger, at first they said, no, I don't want to do anything about the Alamo. He goes, screw that myth. And then when they found out, no, no, it's the real story, every, they were really excited. So if you're, if you're younger, this is finally the Alamo story that a lot of Texans have been waiting for. And do you guys think this book might influence what's going on with Phil Collins? And are you ever going to be able to listen to In the Air again by Phil Collins? I think there's... I, I think George P. Bush has a responsibility to figure out he claim, whether or not this collection really is worth $15 million. If he's, does he really have Jim Bowie's personal knife? Hint, hint, he probably doesn't. But before he spends $300 million to build a museum to this stuff, I think the state has an obligation to figure out what's right and what's not. And of course, Phil can take back his collection anytime he wants. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. We'll see how it turns out. Well, guys, it's been wonderful to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. It was fun to have all three of you on the show and learn so much about the true story, the Alamo. You guys just destroyed my whole Disney fantasy a story that I was taught as a kid. But that's okay. I'm used to. We've already blown up John Wayne and everything else. So I'm on the I'm on the Enlightenment tour. Sleeping Beauty also was made up. Sorry. To Damn it! Damn it! <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> That's our All next right. book. I'm going to go after cry. Not so charming. It was, he was kind of creeper. He's going in a girl's oh, yeah. room at night while she's asleep and stuff. So, Kissing man, a sleeping girl around yeah, her door. On? That's, that's totally, we need to meet two You leave a woman guy. with her dwarves. That's it. We need to, that's right. meet to, yeah, we need to meet two of them as well. Yeah. Guys, it was wonderful to have you guys on the show. Continue success. And I hope the book is a smash hit and helps people uh, realize some of these myths that we have. Thanks to all of you for being on the show. Give us your plugs as we go out. I got Chris Tomlinson, uh, Houston Chronicle, San Antonio Express News, and Forget the Alamo. Jason Stanford from the Substack newsletter, The Experiment, and other bylines. Brian Burrow from Audible.com and Vanity Fair Magazine, and I hope you enjoy Forget the Alamo. Thanks, guys. That felt like one of those NFL things where they profiled the, each of the players and they introduced the college they went to. That's how that felt there for a second. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming on the show and sharing all that with us. Guys, order up the book. Be the first in your blog to read it, first on your book club to read it. You can brag that you got it first. Pre-order that baby up. Forget the Alamo, the rise and fall of an American myth. I think it's going to be really important by Brian Burrow, Chris Tomlinson, and Jason Stanford. You can order up wherever fine books are sold. Thanks so much for tuning in. Be sure to go to youtube.com. You can see the video version of this. You can also go to Falls there, and you can also go see us on all the groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all those different places. Follow the show there. Uh, stay safe, be good to each other, and we'll see you guys next time.